I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me from such self-help videos as Smoke Yourself Thin and Get Confident, Stupid. Well, now I'm here to tell you about the only real path to mental health. That's right. It's the Brad Goodman something or other. Weeks ago, I was a washed-up actor with a drinking problem. Then Brad Goodman came along and gave me this job and a can of fortified wine. Mm. Ah, sweet liquor eases the pain. And now I'd like to introduce the man who will put the U in improvement. Brad Goodman. Thank you so much, Troy. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk, where you get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and if you don't, my buddy Sean Kelly is going to kick your butt. Isn't that right, Sean? Yeah, look out. I mean business, and he means business. We mean business. <laughs> Taking care of business, TCB. <laughs> All right, man, thanks a lot. So we're here to talk about your new book, uh, Don't Call It Hair Metal which is a great read. Um, just Thank recently you. spoke with Dee Snyder, as I was telling you before we uh, started to record, and he's he, he just glosses about it. Um, I've been a hair metal fan, but I mean, it's not the, you know, like basically the intro to the book is about, um, what, do, what do you call it? What categories? Glam rock, hair metal, heavy metal, that sort of thing. So just give the viewers a quick synopsis of the uh, book, and then uh, we'll get on with it. Right. Well, basically, uh, my initial impetus for writing the book was um, I, I, I am very passionate about this music. It stayed with me all my life. So uh, I think it, uh, 80s rock play is an important part of the overall rock and roll tapestry. And I find that sometimes, in my experience, uh, that music tends to be relegated to uh, a picture ca caught in time, uh, an image, a um, uh, and, and and tends to be all heaped together under one pejorative term called hair metal, which didn't actually exist when I was listening to that music. We just called it rock and roll. And it, it really only came, that term only came about, you know, after the fact, you know. Uh, I think the first time I saw it, the term hair metal was, I was working in a record store and one of those, you know, compilation albums, hair metal as seen on TV, you know. Um, but, but, I started off kind of wanting to write almost a defense of the artistic intention uh, that I knew existed because I followed these artists, not just the music that I loved back then, but as they grew and developed as artists, uh, you know, with bands like Mr. Big being a prime example. Um, and I wanted to delve into, at first it started as a defense, but really I kind of abandoned that early pretty on in the book. And it really becomes more uh, a discussion about the artistic intention and the sonic development of the music I love throughout the 80s and beyond. Right. Um, and speaking of Mr. Big, um, very, very um, uh, interesting as I started to read the book, the first few pages. Um, tell uh, the viewers, uh, especially the Mr. Big fans um, that are going to be watching this, what do they have in store for what does what Defying Gravity, that song, mean to you personally? Well, it was a song that uh, helped me deal with a, a very poignant moment in life, the passing of my father. And it was something that, uh, you know, I, I related to that song. Music has always been uh, a healing bomb for me, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's something I've used to get me through hard times. That's nothing unique. But, you know, I, I, I had earmarked that song as something that I knew I was going to listen to. Uh, it helped me prepare in advance for his passing and then helped me after the fact. And I, I use that song as uh, an example of the uh, the importance of that music to a lot of people. I think there's a lot more underneath the hood of the artists that kind of came to prominence in the 80s than they're given credit for. It's not just party music. It's not just nothing but a good time. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that either. I mean, that's a huge part of it. But a lot of that music, uh, a lot of the musicians from that era... Uh, they kind of all get lumped in under the mm -hmm. same umbrella. And I wanted to show that there was diversity, musical diversity, um, lyrical diversity, artistic diversity. Within yeah, for sure. I article. mean, um, I guess the, the the phrase would come about just based on appearance, like glam rock, hair metal, because of um, the extreme, you know, hairstyles. I mean, those, what was that, Aquanet back in the day? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. But you know, we don't call new wave uh, 
flock of seagull rock. You know what I mean? Like, right. I mean, they, we could call that asymmetrical hair rock. We don't do that. We don't call yeah. 50s music pompadour rock, right? Yeah. It seemed that the hair took precedence over sometimes the music. And certainly you could make an argument that uh, at many times in the 80s, image did take precedence because it was also uh, coming along with the corporatization of record companies, right? Mm -hmm. Where they were actually looking for formulaic things because you started bringing in bean counters as opposed to music fans running these companies. And they were looking for what worked in uh, uh, the image conscious zeitgeist of the MTV era. So right. yeah, th there's certainly arguments to be made. And, and I listened to I have diverse voices in the book, you know, kind of arguing that there's nothing wrong with the term hair metal because it is very apt. Uh, I just thought that uh, I've heard it used in a pejorative sense too yeah. many times in my life that I, I, I felt I had to make some kind of uh, argument for the uh, artistic merit of the best of it. Right. And, and you even um, point out in the book that even the term hair metal, it's not it, the, let's say the lay listener somebody who's not a fan of, say, that 80s kind of music, um, they would think that hair metal is all the same, but it's um, going into that genre of, of um, 80s music in that category, um, you've got bands like Iron Maiden, Diverse, um, Motley Crue, Difference. So there's a lot of different styles in the one genre that people don't really um, understand if you're, if you're not an avid listener of um, 80s music like you and I are. Well, that's why I kind of, what I do in the book, I actually get to the roots of, of, of hard rock and metal to start off with, just to kind of get some groundwork for what this hair metal stuff was supposed to be made up of, right? Because really, you, you're right. Like when Motley Crue first came out, it had as much to do with new wave and punk as it did to do with anything that you would have seen on the Sunset Strip after, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. Iron Maiden... Uh, and it's funny, they, they're, they're kind of coming out of this new wave of British heavy metal scene, which was also very diverse. I mean, you had bands like Girl, who really had more in line with the, the glam rock scene of the of the 70s. You had bands like, um, you know, uh, Tigers of Pantang that were really more mm -hmm. of a classic rock band. So, yeah, like, you know, I think uh, journalists, it, 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 they, like new wave of British heavy metal or hair metal, all these are great taglines to kind of put on a headline but it doesn't tell the whole story let's put it that right way. um one of the chapters i think it was from 1981 to 82 was really uh it was really i really liked it um you know especially for a few reasons especially as a canadian and a lot of american viewers might not know this but certain times in the 80s a lot of these great bands produced great albums at little um at little mountain in bc with mike fraser Bruce Fairbairn and uh, Bob Rock. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, I mean, you could make an argument that uh, Canada is kind of the sonic, you know, the sonic birthing ground of, of, of a lot of the commercial hard rock of the 80s with the success of Loverboy uh, and, and, and earlier bands like Streetheart. And, you know, like Canada played a big role. That sound, even the groove of those bands playing in Vancouver, you know, kind of really metronomical and really on the beat and kind of pulsing with those crunchy guitars with pop melodies and, and synthesizer overtones mm -hmm. really did set a sort of commercial FM radio sonic template for 80s hard rock. Right. Um, but I think what I was going for more was um, bands like Bon Jovi, Motley Crue. They came up to BC to, to make their music. Yeah, that was later on, right? So what happens is you're hearing bands uh, like Bon Jovi was becoming aware of bands like uh, Black and Blue, who made a record with Bruce Fairburn. Mm -hmm. uh, Honeymoon Suite, the big prize. Those records were very influential on those bands because they loved the sonics of them. You know what I mean? When when Bon Jovi heard the sonics, they had, that was a band that had a big hit with Runaway. And then the next record, 7800 Degrees Fahrenheit, didn't quite do what they expected. So they were looking at bands like Loverboy who were having success. Where is that Loverboy? They're recording at Little Mountain Sound with this team. It was the sound that they were looking after. They loved the sound of the Honeymoon Suite record. They loved that black and blue record. And really, I make an argument that uh, Slippery One Wet is a combination of uh, the black and blue record and uh, and the big prize. You know, it's kind of you, you keep playing around with the bits until you get the right thing. Right. <clears throat> See, I always thought it was because um, BC had um, uh, adult entertainment clubs. 
Well, it, I guess that was good for keeping people entertained and focused long <laughs> enough to stay in BC because I, I, without getting too deep into it, that is definitely part of the lore. And that was definitely, uh, I think that definitely inspired some of the music on some of those records. Let's put it that way. If, if, you're, if liner notes are to be believed, just yeah, read yeah. the liner notes of Slip for One Wet and you'll see who gets thanked. <laughs> I hear you. So um, where can people go to um, order their copy, uh, Sean? You can get, uh, it, it's available everywhere uh, books are sold. I have a wonderful company, uh, ECW Press, who's done an amazing job of getting the book out all over. So, you know, your Indigos, your Barnes and Nobles in the States, you know, uh, and, and of course at all your local indie bookstores, which you should support, your Amazons. But you can also get a signed copy to come to a little little signature guitar pick at rockpapermerch.com. Look Rock. for Sean Kelly. Papermerch.com. I'll put the link in the um, description box below. Um, yeah, thank you. R right now, you um, you just returned from uh, Europe, where you were um, you were telling me you basically did a double header with Lee Aaron and Coney. Speaking of Coney, um, you'd met Steve Harris um, when you were um, supporting uh, Coney or, or, or um, British Lion, and yeah. you wrote interestingly. And a lot of people are like, I love how you write. Actually, I got to ask you this. Um, did you get a ghostwriter? Are you really that good of a writer? And I, oh. and I know the answer. Well, thank you very much. I uh, no, I that was uh, that was just me toiling away at my my kitchen table. <laughs> that's did you. Uh, me. Did you graduate in English in university as well as music? No, but I read a lot of rock magazines. So I, I, I you know, I went I went to the the University of Kerrang, Hit Parader, and circus. Guitar World, <laughs> and Circus, and Faces. And yeah. all those great rock mags, you know. I mean, I, I do love reading, and, and I've always loved writing. Um, I, I don't know if it comes naturally, but I enjoy doing it. I certainly enjoy talking about it. So maybe I'm always looking for another word to describe the music I love. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, anything on the um, on the docket for uh, music uh, coming out, um, i.e. Lee Aaron, or um, anything else with Coney Hatch, or... Just Sean yeah, Kelly solo. Yeah, there's a few things gone to go. Actually, uh, Coney Hatch has a new live record coming out on Explorer One Records uh, on August 11th called Postcards from Germany, which features two new tracks. Uh, the first of which is the new single, uh, It's About a Girl, which uh, was released last week, but uh, the video comes out this week. Very excited about that. It's an honor to be on uh, the first new Coney Hatch music in almost a decade. Right. Um, so that album's coming out, Postcards from Germany. We're, uh, this summer I'm touring with Lee Aaron. We're touring behind the Elevate album, which has been out for a while, but doing well and uh, touring behind that. And uh, yeah, the Crash Kelly thing's interesting. Uh, the rights for my my first few albums are, are reverting back to me. So there'll be some reissues of, that, of those uh, first three Crash Kelly records as well as a new project that's actually going to coincide. You're the first person I'm talking to about it, actually. Right it's going to coincide with the release of, of the Don't Call It Hair Metal book. I'm going to take on uh, some different songs from each of those eras and do them in the Crash Kelly style. So have some fun with that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a new Lee Aaron project we started. I don't know if I can say anything about that, but I did a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, and, and and I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm working on a documentary. I'm an executive producer and the composer for the score of a new documentary on uh, CanCon and its effects on the 80s music scene. So lots going on, man. Right on um, CanCon. Who was I, who originally brought that to the mainstream that they were fighting? Basically, if the viewers don't know, CanCon is just the rights to your own music, correct? And then, no, no, CanCon uh, was a uh, government uh, regulation that was passed to uh, basically uh, it, it forced broadcasters to pay a certain amount of Canadian content on the radio. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so uh, so that allowed, that opened the gateway for Canadian artists to actually have a fighting chance because otherwise we were basically just being funneled in American music and it was harder. You, that's why artists like Neil Young, Joni Mitchell had to go to the States wow. to make it. It actually, the CanCon regulations arguably actually created uh, the Canadian recording industry and helped bands like Streetheart, Loverboy, April Wine achieve greater success here and then ultimately abroad. Yeah, I, I, I knew that. I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking something else. You're, 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 you're thinking SoCan. You're probably thinking yes. SoCan. But you know what? This is the thing. All these, you know, all, all these, uh, you know, acronyms for all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, there's lots of them. So easy to get confused. They're I get confused all the time. <laughs> they're, they're all full of cans. Um, 
So we'll uh, put the description box. Well, we'll put the links in the description box for people to check out this book. It's a really, really good book. Um, Thank you. I mean, just another interesting little tidbit that I uh, I wasn't aware of is just the way that Steve Harris prepares um, his tone. And you said, and I think uh, I remember it was like coined almost like metallic. Yeah. Well, you know, I talk about it because if you, if you, and, and in the context, I'm talking about how things work within the context of a band. It, it like he, it, it bass players like, like Steve and Lemmy and even Billy Sheehan for that matter, they have a very bright, present, clanky kind of tone that by itself you don't normally associate it with bass. Usually if we think of bass, we want a big and full and round booming. But what their sound allows them to do is have a unique voice within their, their music. And once you hear the individual element in the framework of the whole thing, you realize how brilliant it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, Iron Maiden bass lines are signature. They are perhaps the most important part of the instrumental stew that is Iron Maiden. And you wouldn't get that if it sounded like a traditional bass. It just wouldn't cut through the same way. Right. So, right. Yeah. Okay. So everybody go out and check out this book. I'm telling you, it is really a good read. Um, I'm an avid reader. And um, like I said, <laughs> I, it's so well written by Sean. You guys Thank are you. just going to be blown away. Um, the links will be below. And one more thing before, two more things. Who would you say is an underrated Canadian band, let's say from 1980 up until now? Oh, there's a lot of underrated Canadian bands. Uh, I, I don't know how to do this without sounding self-serving, but, you know, I'll I'll go Lee Aaron, Coney Hatch, and Helix. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like, like to me, having been in the situation where I get to actually work with them and feel the musicianship and see the work ethic and, 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 and be part of it, it's world-class all the way. And, uh, yeah, like, I... I, I mean, they're certainly very valued and loved all around the world, but I think really uh, with a couple of other breaks, they could have all been worldwide superstars, you know? Right, right. And you're, um, and, and John Albany, I mean, what a great guitar oh. player he was. And, and a wonderful yes. guy and an incredibly talented engineer and uh, very generous with his time and info. And I've had the opportunity to chat with John a few times. Wonderful guy. And I, I'm honored to play his parts and, and his great songs. With a Sean Kelly twist, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, whether they like it or not, it's going to have that. <laughs> no, I'm sure they do like it because <laughs> you don't want to hear the original um, note for note for note for note. You want to hear um, a, a personality behind the guitar. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I try to keep the, the content pretty close, but but yeah, ultimately, I have to play what I feel. It, 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 or it won't be authentic. I, I, I do believe that, and... If I if I move to do something different, it happens. I'm a pretty organic player, and uh, yeah, I kind of just uh, I ride the wire. I just kind of hope for the catch the vibe, and sometimes I catch it, and sometimes I miss it by this much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sean. So what's the opposite of unsubscribe? I would say subscribe. So you got to smash that like button, yo. Smash the subscribe button so you get these great interviews from great interviewees. And uh, Sean, uh, while you're on tour with Lee, this uh, you said this summer. Yes, yeah, yeah. We okay. we just finished a, a great festival gig, uh, a couple of great festival gigs in Newfoundland, Burlington. Now we're taking the show across Canada. All right, if you can hit Sioux Saint Marie, we'd love to see her again. And you, love to, man. It's been too long since I played the Sioux. Right on. All right, have a great day, man. Take care, Ernst. 